I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly unanimous decision. The Supreme Court preserves access to a widely used abortion drug. How pro-lifers are responding. Trip to Italy. President Biden is among the world leaders attending the G7 summit. What the group is saying about the war in Ukraine. Return to Washington. Former President Donald Trump meets with lawmakers on Capitol Hill. We have reaction. Plus, lost and found. People in Portugal celebrate the Feast of St. Anthony. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Anthony of Padua. Our top story tonight, the Supreme Court has spoken. In an expected reaction from the nation's highest court, justices unanimously ruled to preserve access to the abortion drug Mifepristone. The justices said that pro-life groups lack the legal right to sue over the FDA's approval of the medication. The plaintiffs argued the FDA's decision to allow the drug to be used without an in-person doctor's visit jeopardized women's health. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, a Catholic, wrote the unanimous opinion, saying in part, quote, plaintiffs are pro-life, oppose elective abortion, and have sincere legal, moral, ideological, and policy objections to mifepristone being prescribed and used by others. Uh, for more, let's bring in Heather Hacker, an appellate attorney and former assistant solicitor general in Texas who filed an amicus brief in this case. Heather, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, this ruling certainly a blow to pro-lifers. Were you surprised by the justice's decision? I was honestly not surprised, and I don't think that many court watchers were surprised either, just based on the way that the questioning went at oral argument. It did definitely seem like most justices were concerned with the standing issue, which ended up being the key issue that um, decided the case. So uh, it seemed at oral argument that many of the justices were skeptical of the plaintiff's standing theory here. and so. It's really no surprise that that is what the majority opinion ultimately ended up focusing on. And what does that mean for Danco Laboratories, uh, uh, the pharmaceutical company that manufactures the abortion drug mifepristone? So they intervened as a defendant in the case along with the Food and Drug Administration. And so um, I believe that they made similar arguments here. And so this is a, um, th this the ruling will ultimately result in the dismissal of this lawsuit. Um, now, whether or not another lawsuit could be brought addressing the same merits-based arguments here against the approval of the drug, um, that's a different question. And I think that's something that, um, you know, you could look to see in the future that there may be another case brought with a different party as a plaintiff that would satisfy what the court said about standing. Yeah. And what do you think this decision means for the Biden administration? And what type of impact, if any, could it have in the November presidential elections? Um, I'd, I'm not sure that it will have a major impact. I'm sure the uh, Biden administration would count this as a success. I mean, certainly if you are on the right side of a unanimous opinion at the U.S. Supreme Court, that's certainly a victory. Um, I think that uh, you know, I, I think that I think that really what's happening here is that the ultimate battle, you know, whether or not the 2000 approval for the drug or the 2016 or 2021 or 2023 changes to the the prescription regime, um, you know, whether 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 those are legitimate or not, that question, I guess, has survived to be asked another day um, by a different plaintiff. So. Yeah. You know, the questions will arise again, I think. Um, it's just that for now, I guess this could be counted as a victory for the administration. Heather, any other big takeaways from today? So, uh, you know, again, it was a unanimous opinion. So all the justices agreed. Um, and uh, Justice Thomas actually wrote a concurring opinion where he voiced the opinion that um, like the pro-life doctors in this case did not have standing to assert claims on behalf of their patients that it was his opinion that neither should abortion, uh, pro-abortion doctors have standing to assert claims on behalf of their patients, which of course they have been doing for many, many years since Roe v. Wade. Um, so that was an interesting statement. And then Justice Thomas also raised some questions about a doctrine called associational standing, but he was the only justice that wrote on those two issues. Um, so 
those those were his interests, but no one else joined that. So it will be interesting to see what, if anything, becomes of those two issues later on. Yeah, for sure. Heather, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. God bless. Thank you for having me. All right, for more on the Supreme Court decision from a medical perspective, we go now to Dr. John Prochowski, a pro-life OBGYN and founder of Divine Mercy Care and Tepiak OBGYN. He's also the author of the book, Two Patients, My Conversion from Abortion to Life-Affirming Medicine. Dr. Prochowski, always good to be with you. Um, tell us why continuing to allow the FDA's current rules and regulations in prescribing and dispensing these abortion pills, uh, having it remain in place, why it's such a concern? Tracy, it's uh, good to be with you. Uh, obviously disappointed, but not unsurprised by the decision. Um, chemical abortions are just as violent and probably more viscerally damaging to the patient because she actually sees the result of the medication she takes. So it's actually turning her bedroom, her hallway, her bathroom into a place of violence and hatred. So that's the first piece. Um, this continuing push, um, ignoring really serious complications. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, one in five women will suffer a complication. One in 25 women will have a serious complication. There's studies to show that hemorrhage is about 15% of the time of taking a chemical, a chemical abortion process as well as infection 2% of the time. Now along the side effects and the real danger, one, the FDA over the last, oh, what, seven to eight years since 2016 has increased the duration of time in which the patient can take it from seven to 10 weeks gestation. Bones form around eight weeks. So you're looking at embryos, fetuses, preborn children with body structure mm. and bones. That's the first thing. Secondly, there's now no need for an in-person visit. Are you kidding me? No doctor will lay hands. Oh, by the way, other providers and practitioners other than doctors can also prescribe the chemical abortion pills in the states that uh, where it's legal. Uh, telemedically is how it's being distributed. And on top of that, there is no ultrasound that's needed. What about the risk, significant risk of ectopic pregnancy that then predisposes the woman to death, hemorrhage, and serious surgical disruption if it's not caught early? Every way that medicine says to me, practice excellence, John, um, has been lifted here. No ultrasound. The patient, we don't even know if the patient knows when she conceived. And we all know that the risks of this process increase with gestational age. How many times do we know people who miscalculated their pregnancy and they were a month or two months ahead of where they thought they were? This is the continued catastrophe to occur. It's what's expected when you try to make abortion, the intentional death of one of our two patients as OBGYNs, the intentional death, a foundation of reproductive health, according to the pro-abortion faction. This will continue, and I expect to continue to practice excellent life-affirming medicine, giving my patients really great informed consent, an excellent exam, excellent laboratories, to see how far along, to see what is her blood type, and then to do excellent ultrasounds, not to just show her the baby, but all the medical reasons to date the pregnancy, to see that if it's in the uterus, in the womb, not in the tube. Yeah, Those are all the reasons that I see um, uh, that are going to continue here. Yeah, so concerning. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on, always talking to us about this really important to stay on top no, of No, Tracy, thank you. We appreciate it. And, and maybe, you know, the Supreme Court did hint that they may take a look at this again, so we have to keep praying. And thank you for what you do. God bless you. Oh, God bless you.
All right, President Joe Biden also responds to the abortion drug case, writing today's decision does not change the fact that the fight for reproductive freedom continues, adding the stakes could not be higher for women across America. And while abortion may not be the main topic for world leaders gathered in Italy right now, President Biden still wants the G7 summit to address it. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, a senior administration official tells reporters the president is pushing the G7 for a group statement that includes, quote, women's health and reproductive rights, end quote. We'll keep following that. Meanwhile, the main headline coming out of Italy is the war in Ukraine. President Joe Biden signs a security agreement with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, the U.S. promising to support Ukraine's defense for years to come. Our goal is to strengthen Ukraine's credible defense and deterrence capabilities for the long term. This is an agreement on steps to guarantee sustainable peace, and therefore it benefits everyone in the world because the Russian war against Ukraine is a real, real global threat. Also at the G7 summit in Italy, Biden joined other world leaders to hold Russia accountable for its invasion. The U.S. and European countries agreed to lock down sanctioned Russian assets until Moscow pays Ukraine back for the damage it caused. The deal underpins a new $50 billion loan package. As we gather this morning, Ukraine's forces are in a tough fight. Biden's top defense leaders also keeping up the pressure on Vladimir Putin at a NATO meeting in Brussels, Belgium. The way the Russians have uh, uh, lost uh, personnel but also lost uh, uh, platforms um, is, is pretty traumatic uh, from a uh, number standpoint. In addition, G7 leaders also talked about global investment and took time to view a skydiving demonstration. Also tonight, we are awaiting President Biden's meeting with Pope Francis. That will take place tomorrow, Friday, when the Holy Father attends the G7, discussing the risks and rewards of AI, artificial intelligence. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. All right, thank you, Owen. Former President Donald Trump spent the day on Capitol Hill for the first time since the January 6 riots back in 2021. The presumptive Republican presidential candidate met with House and Senate Republicans and stressed GOP unity and more. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Eric. Well, good evening, Tracy. Yes, Republicans gave the former president a hero's welcome. He met behind closed doors, as you mentioned, with first with House Republicans in the morning and then GOP senators later in the day. The former president then said a few words to the media surrounded by a group of GOP senators and spoke about bringing change to America come this November. One thing in common, we want to make America great again. We want to make our country great again. We're a nation that's in decline. We're a declining nation. We're a nation that is being laughed at all over the world. We have a leader that's being laughed at all over the world. And uh, we're going to turn it around. We're going to turn it around fast. Earlier, a crush of media, protesters and supporters anxiously waited for a glimpse of the former president's arrival. Afterwards, I caught up with lawmakers. I think the real message he's saying is that I had the right policies before on border and energy and you know, the economy and foreign policy, and I'm going to re-implement those when we get back in office. He talked a lot about national security, and, uh, and, and I kind of believe what he had to say, that a lot of these things that are happening around the world today would not have happened if he was in office. They say the Catholic Church and the abortion issue was also discussed. You should know that the president stands behind the Catholic Church. He specifically mentioned the persecution of Catholics uh, by the Biden administration and how wrong it was. He said, make sure that you, you exercise your own conscience, to talk about it, share your conviction, and, um, and, and do that uh, in a way that makes sense to people. And, and I think uh, he had made a good point. He, he has said that after the Dobbs decision that um, the, the states are handling the issue right now. As for the yeah, meeting absolutely. with senators? He brought in such a tone um, that set the room and said right off the bat, man, listen, 90% of the stuff we all agree on, there's 10% that we may not, but let's set it aside. we got a game to win in November. Senators say the former president spoke about places that generally have been unfriendly to his message, like the Bronx and San Francisco, are now welcoming him. There is an engagement by Americans, a yearning, uh, for uh, a, a better America. And 
he says you can feel it in places where you couldn't feel it in the past. But Democrats claim adopting a Trump agenda would be disastrous for America. If America followed this Republican agenda, the middle class's incomes would go way down, inflation would go up, income redistribution would be very, very bad. Climate, they want to get rid of all the great climate work we did last time would be out the window. During the meeting, the former president did not talk about a possible vice presidential pick, but the first thing that he did do was when he met with senators, he walked over and shook the hands of Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, who he had a strained relationship with. Now both men had nothing but praise to say about each other after that meeting. Tracy. Well, Eric, I understand the Senate voted today on another bill covering IVF. What can you tell us about that? That's right. That was the IVF bill that uh, came from Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth, uh, who herself had used the technology to uh, birth her two children. Now, Republicans uh, actually uh, did block it from proceeding. Republicans tell me that they voted against it because it trampled religious liberties and imposed transgender requirements. Tracy. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. We appreciate it. Alvin Bragg, a key player in former President Trump's hush money felony conviction, will testify before a House Judiciary Committee on July 12th. In a hearing today on Capitol Hill, the Attorney General of Missouri says that Bragg's actions are un-American. We are a nation of laws that are supposed to be equally applied. Instead, the left has prioritized its hatred of President Trump above the rule of law. To put it plainly, the left hates President Trump more than they love this country. Andrew Bailey made the remarks during a hearing on the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Lawmakers examined the case against the former president, who was found guilty of 34 felony counts. All right, now to Moscow, where Russian prosecutors say an American journalist will stand trial on espionage charges. Wall Street Journal reporter Aaron Griskovich is accused of collecting secret information from a Russian tank factory for the CIA. Russian officials have not provided any evidence to back up the charges. Griskovich and his employer vehemently deny the charges. The U.S. government has designated Gerskovich as wrongfully detained. No word on when his trial may begin. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including a gathering of church leaders. What you need to know about the U.S. Bishops Conference this spring. Dr. Matthew Bunsen joins us with the details. Welcome back. The U.S. Bishops Conference is meeting this week in Louisville, Kentucky. Among the topics up for discussion include immigration, a national mental health campaign, and the Eucharistic revival. The bishops will also discuss opening the calls for beatification and canonization of Adele Bryce, who saw Our Lady of Champion in Wisconsin in the 1850s. And for more, let's go to Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Vice President and Editorial Director of EWTN News. Dr. Bunsen, always good to be with you. Um, first off, I understand the bishops are reacting to the Supreme Court ruling on Mifepristone. What are you hearing? Yes, that's right. Uh, in fact, uh, the conference uh, just issued a formal statement uh, through its spokesperson, Shiko Noguchi, uh, in which they did two interesting things. The, the first is to note that this was a decision on the part of the Supreme Court on procedural grounds. That's something I know that uh, we'll be looking at very closely in the days to come. Uh, but then the bishops went back, as they always do, to expressing their concern for the risks that uh, this decision is going to pose for women and girls. Uh, and once again, the bishops have spoken out uh, that A, abortion is not health care, and B, uh, that the safety of women and girls is paramount uh, to the bishops in, in terms of their pastoral care uh, for them, for women who make this decision. Yeah, definitely concerning, and we're going to keep our eye on this for sure. Um, on to the meetings now. So what are the biggest agenda items for the bishops in their public session at the meeting? And also, any idea of what has been discussed so far in their closed sessions? Yes, uh, well, as, as you enumerated, uh, there are a number of items that the bishops are considering this time around. Uh, the mental health campaign, uh, they wrapped up their session today with uh, what I thought was a very poignant set of discussions, as well as some roundtable discussions among the bishops uh, about their own experiences uh, in dealing with what has been an ongoing campaign to help people who are suffering uh, from various forms of mental illness. Also on the agenda are the document for Native Americans or indigenous ministries, uh, as well as ministry to young people, which is in some ways the, the carry forward from uh, the synod of bishops that took place in 2018 on youth. And then the bishops are also approving some liturgical documents uh, 
inside, uh, we were just able to confirm through the press conference that was just held at the conclusion of today's proceedings. Uh, we know that the bishops are also talking about the campaign for uh, Catholic campaign for human development, uh, which is one of the bishops' uh, agencies to help alleviate poverty, which has been somewhat controversial over the years, in part because some of the programs that they have seemingly favored in their funding, uh, but also because of the uh, financial stresses that have been created uh, in trying to keep this campaign going. So we'll have to see if there are any formal statements coming out of the conference on that uh, department itself, although the controversy, I'm sure, will remain. Yeah, and Matthew, what did the Pope's ambassador to the United States, uh, Cardinal Christoph Pierre, what did he have to say to the bishops? Yeah, there's always great interest in what uh, the papal ambassador, the papal nuncio to the United States has to say. In this case, the long-serving Cardinal Christoph Pierre, who was made a cardinal just last year, he spoke beautifully, I thought, and very theologically about adoration, about the Eucharist, within the wider context of everything that we're talking about uh, this summer, which is the National Eucharistic Congress and the National Eucharistic Revival, uh, using the gorgeous imagery theologically of our Lord's risen, risen Lord uh, meeting with the apostles and helping them to have that encounter uh, with his wounds uh, to heal their own. And he used that as a metaphor for the many challenges that bishops face today. So rather than being in any way confrontational, which uh, some will claim that the, the cardinal has disagreements with American bishops, he was really much more uh, forward-looking uh, and much more positive and really giving encouragement to his brother bishops. Yeah, and before I let you go, um, Matthew, we had mentioned Adele yeah. Bryce um, yes. and approving the canonization cause for her. Can you tell us a little bit more about who she was? Yeah, well, it is customary for bishops to ask for bishops of the United States to give their approval, their assent uh, to a cause for canonization as it's being opened. In this case, uh, Adele was a recipient of the magnificent apparition of the Blessed Mother in 1859 in Wisconsin, what is now Our Lady of Champion, uh, and it is the first formally approved Marian apparition in the United States. And I think the assent from the bishops is going to be very important in moving this cause forward. And this is uh, yet another demonstration of holiness in the life of the church, not just in our history, uh, but carrying forward now as we're all called to be saints. Absolutely. Very exciting for sure. Dr. Benson, great to be with you as always. Appreciate it. God bless. God bless. Let's keep the bishops in prayer. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, recruiting pitch. Learn how you can help the Blue Army, the U.S. group dedicated to Our Lady of Fatima. Plus, Putting the feast in feast day, we'll explain. As mentioned earlier, today is the feast of St. Anthony of Padua. It is also the anniversary of the second apparition of the Blessed Virgin to the children at Fatima. That one group in New Jersey is dedicated to spreading awareness of Our Lady's message. The Blue Army of Our Lady of Fatima was founded back in 1947. During the Cold War, a local priest discovered the messages of Our Lady of Fatima. He and a friend built a shrine to her. The group prayed for the conversion of the atheist Soviet Union and used the term Blue Army to counter the Soviet's Red Army, now called the World Apostolate of Fatima. The group seeks to spread messages of prayer and peace. All right, for more now, let's turn to David Carolla, Executive Director of the World Apostolate of Fatima USA. David, great to be with you today. We really appreciate it. Uh, remind us again about the messages from Fatima and how they remain relevant today. Well, Tracy, I think people just have to look at the news, and you, and you can see the, the, the warnings of Our Lady, the promises of Our Lady 107 years ago. Uh, you know, <laughs> if my requests are heeded, and, and uh, you know, the bloody history of the 20th century into the 21st kind of speaks for itself. You know, wars and all these things that have happened, many things probably didn't happen because people did adhere to a great degree, but many did happen. And I think this is... Uh, but the, the message of Fatima, believe me, is more relevant today than it was in 1917. These are not my words. These were the words of St. Pope John Paul II some 30 years ago. And it's even more relevant today. Today, we're celebrating the second anniversary of Our Lady's appearances, her second appearance in June of 1917. And of course, we've done much with EWTN and, and our centennial time back in 2017, and obviously ongoing. And, um, you know, this is when she presented her Immaculate Heart. 
and asked for reparation. This was the, this was the reassuring apparition after the introduction in May. You know, now now it's for you children to understand, and by the you children, I mean by extension us, that we have to live in accord with what she's requesting. You know, she gave us the beautiful decade prayer. Oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins and save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. Well, you know, and that's when, you know, the children asked, will they go to heaven? And she said, yes, just send to Francisco soon. And of course, you, uh, Lucia, will stay a while longer to make me known and loved. And of course, that while is 88 years, gives you an idea of what eternity is. But she did say something there, which I think really resonates. And she said, will I be alone? And she goes, no, my immaculate heart will be your refuge. David, tell us about some of the projects um, that your group is working on. I know you're really involved uh, in the Eucharistic revival as well. We are. We have an extremely busy year, uh, beautifully. I mean, of course, you know, it's a little overwhelming for the staff and the volunteers and all. But yes, we are very much involved. Our, our Pilgrim Virgin Statue program has just been so busy this year. You know, Vancouver, British Columbia, California, Portland, Oregon, Ohio, Pennsylvania, now in New York, as you see, we're, we're covering the country. Very busy, very beautiful. How can our viewers participate with you all in these initiatives uh, with Our Lady of well, Fatima? Please, of course, our website, bluearmy.com, has everything listed. Uh, you can come on, and we will we would appreciate all help that we can get. And again, we're you know we're <laughs> we're we're really struggling this year because we you know we limited resources, limited people, and we're and we're trying we're, we're but we're throwing everything at it this year, Tracy, because we feel this is for all the marbles. You know, we have to reinstate and you know in this or rekindle, I should say this real belief in a real presence. And I do believe that people are, now are starting to understand that. I think they're seeing that if they join in these efforts, like what we're doing, they will they will see this, this this things coming forward. What this event today, the second apparition of Our Lady of Adama that we are commemorating here, you know, is, is when she presented her Immaculate Heart, and she did make a promise that my Immaculate Heart will triumph, David, thank you so much for coming on and speaking to us about all of this. We really appreciate it and for everything you do. God bless you. Thank you, Tracy. Great to be with you. And finally tonight, as we mentioned earlier today, it is the Feast of St. Anthony of Padua and the streets of Lisbon, Portugal have come alive with festivities. The annual festival of St. Anthony brings many sights, sounds, and even the smell of grilled sardines. The event brings together people to socialize, dance, and eat traditional Portuguese food and, of course, drinks. The festival takes place throughout the month of June with peak celebrations on the night of June 12th into the 13th. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook X and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.